I will really ask a question and any of you can take up the question and, and respond and another one of you can add to what the other one has said. When we talk about emerging shifts in civic space, politics and technology, there's so much in there. Would you say that the technological revolution and the current pandemic are the most important drivers for the recent past and the foreseeable future? Right, so how does it work? Do I wait for Nanjala? No, you can speak. Um, Hi, Nanjala, can you hear us? She can and she's smiling at you. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Sure, I can go first. Um, I think that the pandemic... Well, we can't um, hear right. Nanjala's sound on this side. Uh, Nanjala, if you could just hold on a bit while we figure that out. Perhaps, Dr. Stella, you could go first while we sure. wait for while Nanjela's sound is sorted. Right, so it's good that I've tested the technology right now. Um, as is clear, it is very empowering. It can also be very disempowering, um, particularly for those of us who may not necessarily be as tech savvy as um, many others. I tend to claim that the age for myself and very many of the commas and millennials say to me, you are too old, you don't belong to us. So just to go back to the question you asked about technology and COVID-19. Um, part of my introduction that you need to make uh, includes the fact that I'm a political actor right now based very squarely in the opposition in Uganda as we gear up towards uh, our elections. I position myself very intentionally as an opposition political actor, as an activist doing politics of liberating Uganda from your decision. Having said that, I find that technology for me as a political actor, among everything else, it has enabled academics, it has enabled civil space, it has enabled all these things, but in terms of politics are very boring, particularly in dictatorships and countries that don't have as much democracy, in countries where internet freedom has been Highly repressed. I'll keep talking, although I don't think they mean nothing. Um, so I can see myself, guys, you're making practice with technology, <laughs> and I'll try to think as the technocrats work out what's happening. Um, the ability to create voice has just happened. The ability to visibilize myself, publicity is happening across nations. So we can talk to that. And we're going to need that going forward, specifically those of us who are in repressive contexts. I want to talk about Uganda, but I'm sure wherever else in Africa we are, someone can speak about repression. And so we celebrate that right now, my picture is there, uh, and it's getting clearer. So voice visibility are going to be necessita necessitated a lot using technology. COVID-19 is an interesting um, reality, an interesting phenomenon, because while it's very empowering so in, in terms of uniting us across the globe, we have a human thing, it is also very disempowering at the same time. I think that very similar to technology, COVID-19 is not going anywhere. Very similar to technology, COVID-19 cannot be controlled by particular governments, or states, or people. These are very organic, difficult to control, entities, I feel. And because of that, they are very empowering. We can use COVID-19 to do so many things because it's not going well. However, I feel that um, in the same breath, because of the power they have, because of the enabling they give to us as actors, especially those of us who are opposed to repressive governments, that therefore they open up themselves to surveillance and monitoring and penalties and the world of autocrats, particularly, is working hard to ensure that um, they crack down on the many enabling possibilities, on the many steps taken forward, we can take forward uh, using technology and mobility. Shall I stop there for now? Oh, well, let's check with Nanjela and see if we can actually hear her if she started to speak. Hi, can you hear me now? Uh, no, we still cannot hear you. Test, test, one, two, one, two, test, test, one, two, one, two. 
Can you hear me now? No, we still cannot hear you. Um, so the participants uh, that are that are attending this conversation online can hear you, but the people in the room on this side cannot hear you. But uh, I think we can strain to hear you. For the people that have computers and laptops um, in the room, let's switch to that. And Nanjela, please proceed. Sure. Um, so I think it's really important to balance out, and this is really the main argument, that one of the main arguments that I make in my book and in my writing, my research, we have to balance out what technology makes possible with what people are doing. And so we can't attribute everything to the fact of technology. Really, we have to keep the conversation about people's agency and people's decision making in the, in, on the table as well, that it is whatever technology is going to, whatever is going to happen as a consequence of technology is going to be a product of people's agency and people's um, decision making. And that is why it's very important to make sure that we are not just addressing issues of access and making technology uh, different platforms available, but we're also having much more um, normative conversations about um, giving people um, um, or helping people find use um, for technology within their own specific context. So not just um, having a mobile phone in every hand, which has been the main sort of developmentalist argument about tech, but also to start to think beyond that to what is the, what are the political actions that people are taking online and what are the social consequences um, that technology has on people's lives. I think that to frame COVID-19 as an opportunity or whatever is really, um, well, we have to really contend with this, the fact this is an incredibly dangerous um, um, disease. And so far, Africa seems to have evaded the worst of it um, because of various structural social issues. But, you know, we look at similarly situated countries like um, the countries of Latin America and the countries of Asia, and we see that the threat is a lot, is, is, is real. And it's, it's we, we have to be um, uh, cognizant of the fact that it's going to, if should we be exposed to an, a much more intense outbreak than what many African countries have felt right now, um, that things could get very bad very quickly. And so in the conversations as we're talking about um, what COVID could mean, what COVID could represent, we also have to sort of keep the human cost of it um, uh, in perspective that it is, it is a, it's a bad thing that, that is happening in the world right now. Um, having said that, I think that this is an invitation for a global reset, and it's an invitation for us to reframe, especially the neoliberal concept of what the state is and what the state is for. I think over the last 20, 25 years, maybe even 30 years, you know, if we go back to structural adjustment, we go back to the, the way in which the, um, the state was unmade, and, and especially the post-colonial state, was unmade and then remade in this uh, uh, neoliberal mold, the, the cutting of spending on public health, the cutting of spending on public education, the cutting of spending, all of these aggressive cuts in the name of efficiency have left us with states that are much more vulnerable than they should be. And that is the consequence that we're reaping now. The states that are having the hardest time to deal with the COVID pandemic are the ones that have had the most aggressive action against public health, public welfare spending. And so really what, it, what is on the table is, is, is an opportunity to reimagine what the state can do and, and what it should be doing for all of us. I think um, we have to go back to the basics of why we live in societies, why we live in communities. And um, what COVID is telling us is that we, if as individuals, we are incredibly vulnerable, but as collectives that are predicated on group welfare and group outcomes and the fact that we all would be better off together. Um, those are the countries that are doing well. Those are the countries that, you know, the Taiwans, the South Koreas, the New Zealands, the um, Germany's, the, the countries that have said, you know what, we actually have to invest in, in public protection. So that's how I would frame the COVID moment is, is it's an invitation to reset our expectations about what the state is and what the state is for. And I guess that's to put those two things together. That is what tech is for as well. What tech has done, um, you know, as, as, as Stella was saying, you know, especially in authoritarian contexts, it has allowed people to demand a reset of the relationship between the authoritarian state and the citizen. And, and we just have to keep the pressure up to make sure that this invitation is taken up properly. Um, thank you, Nanjila. So I, I guess we, we agree that uh, COVID-19 and technological revolution 
are important drivers for the foreseeable future. Stella hinted on the upcoming election as, um, and, and my next question, you know, is in that line. The upcoming election in Uganda is obviously a major event in the country, but it is largely shaped by the pandemic. Many governments have encroached on civic rights in the name of dealing with the pandemic. Are we likely to see clampdowns on civic rights even after the pandemic is behind us? Uh, do you think that governments will relinquish the power that they took from the citizenry? Right, so look, we don't know where the pandemic is going. So your question is assuming that the pandemic is going away. I think in order to arrive there, um, we need an assurance of medicine, right? We need an assurance as well of vaccines. So I, to talk about the post-COVID-19 moment, really, it's again an invitation, not just to us as um, as humans, but to our states, to our researchers, to our scientists, and I want to say Africans, Ugandans, that we have a stake in this, right? Um, for me, COVID-19 has been used repressively, particularly by our institutions of state, such as the Electoral Commission, okay, to issue directives or guidelines, quasi-legal, uh, commands, kind of in the name of thou shalt not commit attempted murder, really limiting possibilities for a number of political actors, particularly those of course in the region. And this is in the COVID-19 moment. I don't think because we're going to have um, we're going to have our elections in 2021. I know that Tanzania is very close. And what about Kenya? I think Kenya is 2022. I'm not sure there'll be a post-COVID moment before our elections in the three biggest African historical countries. And so before we talk about the post-COVID-19 moment, I'd like us to work for a while in this historical moment of we are having elections before COVID-19 is here. And I think that what the we can the electoral commission has done, an incumbent government that has been in power for 35 years, a big problem for me. And many others would be oppressed nearly because of the 35 years and the incumbent president is still contesting. We feel that um, COVID 19 is being used to restrict further political space, civic space for us to participate. The COVID 19 guidelines that can that issue said to stop all scientific elections, uh, because I'm speaking to an audience that's also perhaps outside the Ugandan context, I want to explain very quickly that our COVID 19 guidelines. Um, around the election season are forbidding political gatherings of more than five people. And so we have to restrict our campaigns to what they call scientific campaign mode, which is restricted to the use of public media, TV, radio, and social media. Okay, technology is like that. However, um, they go against the very gist of the constitution, which calls for our regular free and fair elections that allow citizens to participate in changing events, right? So before I even leap into the post-COVID-19 moment, I am struggling with this historical moment of we have campaigns today. I'm a political actor who has been forbidden to meet my constituencies. I'm a first time entrant into the political arena. I haven't been a woman member of I've been a lecturer, I've been a, been a prisoner, I've been a, been a, been a, been a, been a poet, I've been a lover, a woman, but I've never really participated in politics, right? And I'm offering myself for the first time, I was looking forward to dancing at the campaign rallies with my blue FDC key, which is the symbol of my party. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. How is an ex prisoner such as myself, who was released in February of this year, belonging to an opposition party, going to campaign effectively? Right. So before you go on, yes. um, I noticed that some of the people online say they're straining to hear, um, is it possible? And uh, one of them says, is it possible to use computer audio directly as computer audio settings and balance? Stella, if you could connect you to the meeting and- Okay, so hi guys, can you hear me? Away from the technology that's disappointing us. I hear myself in your laptop, sorry. Um, but, but, but hi guys, can you hear me a little better? 
Nanjala on your end. Yes, yes. So I will speak into my iPhone, cross my legs and sit back. I don't have to speak into the microphone. So um, as I was saying in response to Josephine, shall I keep rolling? Okay, can you still hear me? I am bringing the phone nearer to my face. I have been instructed. Is this better, people? Great audio. So I'm about to protest against this hotel because it's really disabling my moment to shine at the FIFA 2020. But I will keep going. I, I am not yet in protest mode because we have to talk about COVID-19 and how it is for me uh although i said it's a great opportunity i think right now that the government of uganda is clamping down on my freedom as a political participant in the opposition a woman who doesn't have a lot of income because i was in prison not earning for 15 months and prior to that because i'm a political agitator i'm a dissenter i'm a dissident in this country i was suspended from my job Okay, and so how does one even organize fundraising in this moment of COVID-19 when a lot of funds that have been collected in the name of COVID-19 are being used by, oh, she's saying I should not scream too much. Oh, it's Put fine. It down. Okay, hi guys who are not in Uganda. I have like a million instructions. So I'm working through the put it down. Is this any better people? <laughs> Okay, I have thumbs up from, from, from Nanjala. Thank you, Nanjala, on my feedback. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and what was the question? <laughs> All right, so uh, let me allow Nanjala to wait in a bit and then we can, we can get in because most of the questions are related anyway. So we're going to have right. to so you want to win? <laughs> sure. Um, I think I'm I, just to build on what I think Stella was, was heading towards. I think it's far too early to start speaking about a post COVID moment because um, what was supposed to be a very short um, moment is actually threatening to drag out because of the um, because of the way in which our states have reacted i think the very first mistake that our states made was that they criminalized it, the first mistake that they made is that they criminalized the response to the the pandemic and so you know in east africa the first thing that the governments did um, was they started punishing people for um, for having COVID nineteen, for being exposed to COVID nineteen, for you know even just the, the getting sick became a criminal penalty. Um, in the first two weeks of the lockdown in Kenya, we had the police killing fifteen people, mostly poor and working class people. Um, you know, we had one lady who jumped into the river in order to get away from from the police. We had. Um, a young, a, a man who was working at a market who was a couple of minutes over um, the curfew time and he was shot by the police. And so the criminalization of the pandemic really um, not only drove people uh, deeper underground, but also created a stigma and unnecessarily stigma for people who had survived the, the disease. And so what that did is it drove people underground. And so what could have actually been a very powerful moment to say, well, we're going to, in, we're going to have um, short period, three months of intense coordinated action in order to reduce the impact, the long-term, medium-term impact of the disease, instead became a squandered opportunity where the police could show off their new toys and could um, punish people you know, for being sick. And I think that's why it becomes very difficult to imagine that there will be a singular post-COVID moment barring the discovery of a, of a vaccine. And even then, when we think about a vaccine, we have to think about global inequalities. Um, the way in which the vaccine trials are set up at the moment, African countries are providing samples, um, but we're still at the process where they're having to lobby international organizations to make sure that if a vaccine is developed, it's not gonna be hoarded by wealthier countries. It's not gonna be hoarded. And these are the structural inequalities that are built into the neoliberal capitalist system that we are, we are living in at the moment. And so uh, again, yeah, I think it's just going to be, a, 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 I personally, um, if everything had gone well, I, my personal opinion was that we were looking at a minimum of six months um, of lockdown. Um, unfortunately, things haven't gone well. And so we're not looking at anything 
um, I don't think we're looking at anything resembling normalcy before the end of 2021. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, things are going to get worse before they get better. Um, once the emergency period is over, we're going to have to contend with the social and the economic consequences. Um, we've been told that, for example, the tourism sector in Kenya has contracted by 91%. We're being told that 1.7 million uh, Kenyans have been made newly unemployed. Um, we have children whose school year who are, have only gone this year, have only been in school for two and a half months. Um, the entire school year has been canceled. Um, universities have been closed. And, and so all of that is going to have consequences, food production consequences is going to have social, uh, you know, we have a spike in teenage pregnancies because of the number of young girls who have been pulled from school who are now vulnerable be, um, to sexual assault from family members in their homes, um, you know, being uh, exposed to um, 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 all kinds of violence in their homes because they were safer in school. And so all of these things are going to have consequences. And I don't think there's going to be a post COVID moment um, before 2021. And so what that means to me is that we then have to um, mitigate the impact for the people for, for the next coming months. It has to be about um, disaster management and, and controlling the extreme um, uh, impacts of, of the pandemic. And I think what really, as an as a East African citizen, I think what really frightens me is that there is no leadership in this region. There is no no one who is in government who is demonstrating the kind of empathetic, um, inclusive, forward-thinking leadership that we need. And you know, Stella was talking about how we're all in campaign mode. I mean, Kenya is permanently and perpetually in campaign mode. Um, we are not seeing anybody in Kenya sort of standing up and saying, "Well, here's." why don't we put aside campaign politics and electoral politics and focus on navigating this pandemic? Even in the pandemic, you know, even with the pandemic, we've had leaders having political rallies, gathering people in violation of the social distancing rules, the same rules that poor people have been killed for. Um, so yeah, I think we're in, you know, I, unfortunately, and it sounds very dire, but I think it's, it's just realistic. I think things are going to get more difficult before they get better. And I think, the best we can do is to try and inculcate um, more empathy and more kindness in the way in which our societies are governed and choose leaders who have demonstrated a pattern of empathy and kindness and inclusivity because we're going to need those things in the coming, in the near future, we're going to need those things more than ever. Great, thank you, Nanjela. When, when Nanjela is describing Kenya, it, it feels a lot like home. So I'm not sure if she is, uh, behind a bookshelf somewhere in Uganda, or if well, it's a, it's an East African um, problem. I think all of the countries in East Africa. I think we're in a tough place. I think we we have made some choices, some political choices over the last ten years, and and we we are the storm is coming. When we when we speak about technology and we link it to politics. Can it improve our politics? Can we reach more people now with important information? For example, Stella, the things you were speaking about, will it be possible for political candidates who do not have a lot of cash to reach many people? Thinking about this election that we're getting into, that we're into actually. Mm. So do I speak here? Speak here, 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 Okay, so um, technology for me, as a privileged woman who knows um, how to use the computer and to type, how to write in English, I can afford data when I can. Um, in Uganda, we have OTT, the over-the-top tax, and we have recent directives for us to get authorization from the Uganda Communications Commission or Council, UCC. Uh, and it's not coming free of charge. We have to pay 100,000 shillings per stream, per Facebook timeline, per Instagram account, Flickr, whatever it is, whatever medium it is that we have, per YouTube, right? That's 100,000 shillings. 100,000 shillings is about $30, right? About, about $30, right? Um, so I have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, an Instagram. I do a lot of live uh, recordings. That means that I'm, 
I need about a million shillings every month to just have every year, I think 100,000 per year, right? To, to have my online presence authorized. Remember, I have said I'm a dissident, I'm a critic of this government. What are the chances that UCC is going to give me approval? So in terms of technology as an enabler, it is an enabler. However, because in the first question you asked, I alluded to the surveillance and the technological espionage and the ability of our governments to clamp down really severely and roll back these democratic freedoms we've gained of freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of the internet even, I know that technology can be, they can create prohibitions for us using the law. I was arrested using the so-called Computer Misuse Act. We have a piece of legislation in my country that can get a woman arrested, charged, sentenced and convicted because of a poem, a poem, guys, a poem, a poem I wrote about a dictator. Maybe I write about his mother's vagina, but so what? Freedom of expression calls for freedom of expression. It doesn't say only when you talk about eyebrows and noses and nipples. I talked about vaginas and genitalia, and I'm not ashamed about it because as a literature person, I should have the freedom to express myself using whatever metaphors I want to use, right? And insisting that we need to be able to advance democratic principles and rights in our countries during this moment, using technology, we, is, 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 is incumbent upon any person who believes in voice, who believes in democracy, who believes in their right to express themselves in this moment. I think that technology, however, because the governments realize how powerful it is, for those of us in the opposition, if we cannot exercise our right to assembly, our right to peaceful assembly, our right to association, our right to freedom of expression, how then are we going to exercise our internet freedom? Will I be writing for myself as an individual or as a member of FDC, the oldest political party in the opposition, the strongest political party in my uh, opinion? And as opinionated as I am, the right to express myself about whatever is a right that's inherent. It's in our constitution. I feel that the current regime, legal regime governing how we use technology in our country, particularly social media and the internet is very repressive. The same can be said about the use of technology in as far as radio and TV are concerned. We have licenses, CBS, I'm a Muganda, I subscribe to Buganda Kingdom as much as I'm a Ugandan. CBS has had its license revoked for a long time. So what's the point of having technology when a government can use one penalty and take away your license? Um, in terms of reaching the masses, because I think one of the things that uh, the internet and technology have enabled is the ability for us to enter space democratically. Those of us who previously did not have a voice could not reach particular audiences. However, lack of finance, COVID-19, we are poor. <laughs> we haven't been working, okay? Who affords the cost of operating online? Even just having data, I work in terms of AMBs. I used to work in terms of GB. I've been reduced to MBs, right? And Pakalast, if you know those packages, <laughs> right? Um, and, and these are the realities of the Kampala Woman Member of Parliament, contestant. What about the realities of the people I want to reach in Katanga, in those slums in Kampala, who are my voters? What is their reality in terms of the technology of electricity? How many of them can afford Yaka? Okay, or, and, and these are facts we talk about all the time, but I think that um, COVID-19 as a moment has made us very poor and the advances of technology require a bit of privilege. I'm sorry. Right, one must have electricity and data and the ability to write and the ability to uh, have all these VPN and firewalls and I don't know what, we're trying to beat the government, right? But to do that, it doesn't take your everyday LC3 contestant vying for a position in Kosovo. Kosovo is one of the areas in Kampala, not the other Kosovo some of you may be thinking about. And so I think that the realities of class, the realities of privilege and underprivilege, the realities of government repression, the realities of just trying to survive beyond finding food may make technological advances and their possibilities not as empowering as they would otherwise have been. The last thing perhaps I want to talk about is the penalties and reprisals that can come to one because of taking advantage of the availing of technology. As you said, 
I was arrested twice. Why was I arrested? Because of a poem and a Facebook post on social media using technology. I was sleeping in my bed. I usually post when I'm on my bed, lying on my back, legs up, my pillow stretched out, typing. Okay. It was, well, amen, hallelujah. But what I mean is a very simple moment becomes an international crisis. And this poor woman is shamed using the enabling of technology. My moment in court when I protest and I throw off my clothes and I throw off my bra and I raise my middle fingers is captured with technology. All the prison, I'm spread around the whole world, right? And so there's a cost to pay sometimes. Sometimes it's penalty, sometimes it's imprisonment, sometimes by as you do, just to the participants who are on, um, online, you know, that we can send in their questions. Nanjela, would you like to weigh in uh, on, on what Stella just said? And the participants online, just send your comments or your questions in the chat box and we'll post them to them later on. Nanjela, you're muted. You need to unmute your Sorry, I, I, didn't I, didn't, I didn't realize I had been muted. I was saying I was looking for Stella's book as I was, as she was talking, this is no roses from my mouth. Um, because I wanted to really emphasize that the, the duality that Stella has alluded to, there is a definitely a duality in the way in which um, technology is, is operating. And on one hand, um, we are being, we're able to, connect to each other in a way that was um, really impossible to even imagine. I mean, even within the East African community, I have Stella's book because of someone that I met on social media and because many of us in Kenya had been very interested in, the, in, in, in what was happening with Stella, the women's rights movement in the region. And we had this transnational conversation about um, how patriarchy reacts to strong women because you know we were seeing echoes of what was happening to Stella we were seeing echoes of it in Kenya we were seeing echoes of it in Tanzania and so when the book became available there was this transnational interest you know how can we get the book in Nairobi how can we get the book in Dar es Salaam it's part of this regional conversation that has been happening online and we've seen this neo-pan-Africanist mobilization that is pushing back against the patriarchal capture of of Pan-Africanism. And it's a discourse that's only possible because there is an internet that I can, you know, reach out to Farida in Togo, that I can reach out to Lucha Althesi in, in, in Kinshasa, and we can have conversations with uh, Yon Mahe in Senegal, and we can have conversations with roads in fall in South Africa. These are the things that tech makes possible. But within that, there is obviously the questions of access and the questions of privilege. And so what I what I tell people to do is to evaluate the efficacy of technology within its own universe. So in the global sense of the word, there's not that many people in various African countries who are online. Kenya is an outlier in many ways because we had this dramatic um, uptake because of the 2007, 2008 post-election violence. That's my argument anyway. Um, so we have a, a dramatically high um, um, internet penetration rates, but most of the people who are connected to the internet in Kenya, as in Uganda, as in other African countries, are connecting on their phone. Only about 18% of Kenyan households actually have computers in the home. In addition to that, even if you have a computer, even if you have a mobile phone, electricity access is a problem, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of actual steady, stable electricity connections in people's homes. So those are in, in the universal sense of the word. And then literacy, obviously, though, is a huge problem. I mean, we talk about uh, mobile money uptake. Um, you know, I've, I've, in the previous life, I worked in development and we uh, were trying to roll out a mobile money app in, in, the, in uh, Madagascar and a um, mobile money based um, savings lending club. And one of the things we, we realized was literacy was an issue because the app was designed in French. And the vast majority of people in Madagascar speak Malagasy. And, and it was something that the people who had come up with the project hadn't sort of stopped to think about. They just thought, you know, French is the national language. And so an app in French is going to be fine. You're like, well, you know, <laughs> literacy in, in Malagasy and literacy in French are two distinct things. And so those are some of the global universal things, but within its own universe. 
I think what we've seen, um, you know, having those particular um, caveats in mind, I think what we've seen is people using technology as a platform to articulate issues that the analog public sphere does not want to hear about, that people are starting to mobilize and teller uh, in ways that the analog does can. And it is driven in part uh, public politics that reflects um, more closely our realities. You know, that I think the, the, the capture, the way patriarchy has captured Pan-Africanism, has captured um, uh, the liberation discourse, has captured, um, you know, the legacy of, of freedom and the demand for freedom has less people really hungry for something different. And then that's some of the energy that we're seeing online. 67% of all the tweets that went out demanding that we must free Bobby Wine came from Kenya. Um, most of the tweets that came out when um, the, the second to last time that Boniface Wangi was arrested, many of the tweets that came out came from Uganda. When there was um, a shutdown, when the, Tanzania introduced its uh, taxation, on blogging and there was this massive to that particular um, energy in, in Kenya and in Tanzania. And so we're seeing, um, we have to take the good in with the bad. And the old and, and even, and uh, to wrap up, even we say the bad, we, Oh, and I was in such a role too. What about now? <laughs> oh, well, you see how the internet is trying to get us. Um, let me just finish by saying, um, right. we have to protect the good. We have to be conscious of the bad, that there are all of these structural issues, but even on these, with this uh, space, there are new forms of violence that are emerging on social networks that are emerging online. And so we, we have to gather. Nanjula, we do think you, your connection is um, about abuse and abuse is the truth in the entire order to. Um, I'll come back. Move. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's, let's give you some time to, to swap that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, Stella, you spoke about this, and Angela has also spoken about it how ICT is a double edged sword, facilitating increased voice and citizen mobilization, but providing equally powerful tools to monitor and restrict the legitimate activities of civil society. So we know the spread of ICTs has also led to new legislation regulating these new spaces, often amounting to severe restrictions on freedom of expression. Governments use data that citizens willingly put online to monitor them and employ sophisticated surveillance technologies to track and target activists. Someone I'm sitting next to. How can digital technologies underpin civil powered democracy? Right. Um... Okay. So, um, the legislation exists, right? But one of the things I want to say to preface that argument is um, the fact that a lot of our African uh, parliaments, our legislatures, are just running hard to catch up with the fast evolving pace of technology. We don't have, as much as there is repressive legisl legislation that's coming on board, such as the Computer Mistress Act, which was 20 what? 20, I've forgotten the year, but I was arrested in 2017 using that law, so it must be prior to 2017. Um, there, there are also all these financial monitoring, electronic transfer of funds legislations in Uganda that are really targeting uh, money laundering, particularly money coming from foreign bilateral partners, but also foreign countries, individuals sending remittances, particularly to those, those of us in the opposition. So there is some legislation, but I don't think that 
our parliaments, our legislatures have caught up fast enough. And so there's a space. There, there, there's a space that allows us, first of all, as uh, civic participants, as political actors, as democratic agents to participate in advocating for legislation that does not just repress us, but instead empowers us. And so it's election time, people. First of all, I keep telling, well, it's, it's kind of a bit late for Uganda, but as, as uh, I, I have a call on progressive Ugandans and now Kenyans and Tanzanians to participate in the elections and get enough digital rights uh, allies in our parliament such that when these legislations get to be passed or discussed or debated or reviewed or amendment bills get to be tabled on that table, there are voices representing those of us who believe in digital freedom in our countries. That's one beginning place. That yes, there is repressive legislation, but it is not yet saturating the entirety of the rights we have. They are not repressing us as much as they could have. And that's dangerous to say, because it's also awakening those who make legislation to block our voices and restrict our technological advances that, hey, there's a lot of work to do. And so, and so I'm saying, let's not cry because the legislation is all bad out there. There are possibilities for us to also introduce amendment bills. I have taken the Computer Misuse Act to the Constitutional Court of Uganda for interpretation, right? And I'm waiting for the Constitutional Court to give a feedback. I know that the Uganda Law Society has petitioned uh, was it the Constitutional Court again? against the Computer Misuse Act, for example? And so things, we can start working against that re uh, repressive legislation. So your question really, um, for, for me, I, I had to preface my response in terms of saying, although the legislation is bad, it is not as bad as it could be. I think that uh, the other thing that we can do is to begin to organize counter counter-revolutionary actions that allow us to organize in ways that cannot be beaten by regimes that are governed by legislations that are covered by boundaries, geographical issues of jurisdiction. And so when I was uh, convicted, I'm sentenced to 15 months. We appealed to the high court and I was acquitted I'm not an ex-convict, I'm an ex, an acquitted ex-prisoner who was wrongly convicted because we could dare to, to question if Uganda has jurisdiction, if any court in Uganda has jurisdiction over what I do on Facebook, okay? And so there's an opportunity for us who work in the courts, who work with the laws, who work in protest movements to begin organizing in ways that we can't be pinned down as national entities. And so the laws that govern me as a Ugandan, unfortunately, don't cover me as a Facebook citizen. <laughs> like, you know, how exciting is that to say like, fuck you, Uganda. Whoops, I can't say fuck you here. But again, fuck you, Uganda, because really, you don't have the mandate. I am following Facebook. For Facebook is a community, right? It is not bounded by geography. We have our own community standards. And I know the Facebook community standards. And because Facebook is valuable to me, I can do whatever I do as a Facebook ninja. On Facebook, I'm a ninja. I'm not a small person. And I'm protected by Facebook. As long as I um, adhere to the community standards of Facebook. So what I'm saying is that we must begin to innovatively and creatively think of very simple but possible ways of beating these repressive laws. And I say this as a dissident, right? We are not going to beg our repressive governments to give us permission to do what we have to do under very repressive terms. So I, I, I'm kind of calling the digital freedom movement in East Africa, in Uganda, in the world to rise up to the occasion and begin operating as global citizens because internet is actually global, right? Why should we be restricted by laws that govern Uganda when Uganda is repressing me? And I want a voice to speak about whatever feminists speak about in the language that feminists know to teach a nation that we can rebel. How do I teach a nation to rebel against our oppressor using the tools of the oppressor? Audre Lord says, whoops, if there are no feminists in the house. Audre Lord, a great feminist, a black woman feminist, 
says to us that the master's tools cannot what? Nobody knows. There's no feminist in this house. We can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools, right? So let's create our own innovative tools, very small, small things. I know I'm probably not answering your question, which I have forgotten again. Yes. But you talked about legislation, and I think I, I have. Ref what uh, digital technologies, oh. how can digital technologies and the free citizen power of And I have just been talking about that actually. That one, these digital technologies can allow us to break very repressive laws. Not all the laws in this country are good for us, those of us who believe in voice. And if they say, shut up. Okay, we can mobilize to dismantle those very repressive laws using technology. That's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to say was that um, communities, we have a lot of communities across Facebook. Some of them are open to the same, some of them are hidden. We have learned to mobilize ourselves and organize in ways that can be very obvious for the state, but also covert ways, right? One of them is chat rooms. I love meeting young men on chat rooms and chatting with them, and that is organizing. Because a woman such as myself, who is running for office, is not allowed to sit around, hang around, and chat with young men about the muscles on their bodies. But it's my right as a Ugandan if I want to do that, for example. Very trivial issue, but important for my sensibility and sanity. As a feminist who doesn't get enough access to enough men who are willing to hit on me, right? But a, a very different mode of enabling intimacy and communication and breaking the boundaries that are given to us but by, 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 by ordinary space. And so I think that yes, there are rules, but we should find ways as political actors to beat these rules if they don't work for us as we slowly begin to organize camps around, uh, not just freestyle and Yanzi or men are trash, but also break the computer misuse act, for example, or break the article that the, the UCC directives. I'd like us to be able to organize around don't pay 100,000 shillings to UCC. Such a hashtag would allow us to organize, right? Yeah. So I think that would be very interesting. It would be very interesting to see you on the campaign trail speaking to the masses saying that you're speaking. I suspect that we'll have- This is have safe space for internet freedoms <laughs> uh, defenders, right? Many of my uh, voters, sadly, are oppressed Ugandans who think it's dangerous to operate even on Facebook. And they say, don't take my picture. If you take it, make sure I'm away from you. Make sure I'm not signing the sign I want to sign. Make sure I'm not doing a people power sign. I want them to think I am with the regime. That is how repressed we are. And so the voters that I meet don't have the liberty to exercise their political identity truthfully in this regime. And so we can organize, but yeah, I'm meeting them on internet, but also away from the internet. Uh, Nanjana, would you like to respond? Let's see how this goes. Um, I think that for advocates, for people who are operating within the digital uh, rights space, we have to start thinking across different um, tools and different opportunities that are out there. So uh, legislation is good and, and you know, working within the legal judicial framework is good. And like Stella has said, many of the, we've had since 2013, four or five different attempts at, in Kenya at passing laws to control um, freedom of expression on the internet. So there was misuse of a communications device, computer misuse and cyber crimes act, um, one, the first one, and then, then there was the second one. Um, and all but the last one, in fact, all of them have been challenged in court. The last one, um, 24 parts of it were just thrown out as unconstitutional, but then the, the high court restored them and now they're on their way to the Supreme Court. So that is very good and it's very impactful because it creates a precedent and it, it strengthens the whole rule of law within the country. But you know, it can't be the only tool that's out there. And we have to keep um, thinking about creative ways of engaging with the rights framework that are, isn't necessarily, um, is not necessarily ma married to coloring within the lines or just doing the things that the state thinks is good and proper and whatever. And I go back to, for example, you know, Wangari Mathai and 
um, her habits or her practice of challenging the state directly. And using some of the tools that Stella uses in her own protest works, you know, nudity, um, um, uh, being unconventional, being in places where um, women were not allowed to be and to organize, you know, organizing in, in, in Nairobi Central Business District. I think um, what is really lacking, one of the two things that are really lacking in the digital rights conversation in East Africa, one is localization, one is making rights real, you know, like, how do we get ordinary people to start thinking about um, are demanding their digital rights in a way that makes sense for their local context and, in, in, you know, making those demands um, logical for their local uh, context. And then the other piece that is, is really lacking is that, what else can we do? If we go to the courts and we find that the courts are stacked with judges who are um, uh, on the side of the regime or who are supporting the regime or tacitly supporting the regime, what else is out there? What else can we do in order to demand freedom? Um, I, will stop, I will stop by saying, I don't think that we should necessarily rely on the benevolence of the platforms to work in our favor. Because what we're seeing in countries where there is a much bigger market is that the balance of power is tilted when is tilted towards the states. So when these private uh, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, all of these platforms are good or can be good or bad depending on how they're used, but their primary interest is financial. Their primary interest is profit. They are private corporations that are being run for the benefit of their shareholders. And so when the decision comes between choosing to enter a new market or choosing to defend the digital rights of individuals, they will focus on the financial interests. And we've seen this in countries like Ethiopia, we've seen this in countries like India, we've seen it to some extent in, in Kenya. And so we can't necessarily rely on the benevolence of the platforms to allow us to have the full expressions of our digital rights. It's, it's important for people to keep um, thinking beyond that, the, beyond the survival of these platforms. Another thing that I, I like to emphasize is that we are on social media 4.0. We've had Friendster, we've had uh, MySpace, we've had um, the only social media 1.0 platform that still exists today is LinkedIn. Everything else came and went, came and went, came and went, came and went. So there's no reason to believe that Facebook is going to look the way that does or even exist in the next five years. There's no reason to believe that Twitter is going to exist in the next five years. You know, um, Google meets, Google hang up, you know, 10 years, five years ago, if someone had said um, Zoom would displace Skype, you probably wouldn't have believed them. But yet here we are in a reality where Skype is no longer the be all and end all of video calls and video conferencing. So the space emerges, uh, the space develops very quickly and changes very quickly. And so what I say to advocates, what I say to activists is use the tools that are uh, available to you right now, but don't have strategies that are entirely dependent on the tools behaving exactly the way they're behaving in this moment, because they will change either in response to legislation, either in response to market demands, either in response to profit demands, and whatever your message is, if your message is freedom, if the goal is freedom, it has to be malleable, it has to be portable, it has to be something that will um, survive even if Facebook does not exist, even if Twitter does not exist tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, Nanjina, for that. Um, there's a comment from, there's a comment from Nozipo who says, and she's from Zimbabwe, she says, yes, technology has given access to narratives by Stella from East Africa, which has influenced our mobilization as well. Digital rights are an extension of human rights and African governments generally have closed this cyberspace for activists and opposition. We need to invest in Pan-Africanism technologies that will resonate with us, delivered in our languages as literacy plays a role and will grow our GDP. All right, uh, my, my next question to you, Nangela, and to you, Stella. Does online activism actually translate into positive social change in the offline world? And does the increasing use of digital technologies actually facilitate or does it hinder greater social inclusion? So discrepancies in digital access and skills may in fact push some voices to the margins rather than encourage greater inclusion within society governments, as we see, and now giving more attention to these platforms as well. Right, so shall I go first? Oh, Nanjala, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, I think because it builds on what I was saying, um, 
just now. I think that we, I'm really inspired by, uh, there's a young man in Cameroon who's trying to build uh, an African facing social networking platform. And it's really taking off in Cameroon and they're trying to um, build uh, something that is much more reflective and, and responsive um, to our political needs. I think that it's really fantastic. You know, people want, often want social media, digital activism to do things that it's not necessarily attuned to. And this is one of the points that I emphasize in my book. I think that we have to look at where social media or digital activism is operating on kind of like, I guess, a fair playing field. So social media is really important and these digital conversations are really important for shifting discourses, for shifting narratives, for changing the way people think about ideas. A really good example of this is how we have been, uh, how many people have been advocating around police brutality. Um, five years ago, 10 years ago, when the police killed a person, they would go to the media in Kenya and they would go to the media and they would say the media, he was a thug. And then they would say, and the, the media would report that verbatim, not question it, not query it. And so the narrative was always that if someone was, in, was killed in a police involved shooting, that that person was a criminal. What happened in the last five, six years is that people started to make videos of the police killings. And it's not, it's not the best approach in my view, but make videos of the killings and they would go viral on social networking. There was one really important one actually where the police officer was filmed um, shooting these two young men who turned out to be university students that had refused to give him a bribe. And what has happened in Kenya in the last um, five years is that because of the conversations in social media where people are not only providing evidence but are also um, challenging narratives and are saying, you know, this guy was this guy's son, um, he was a student, this young man was on his balcony, he wasn't doing anything, here are the numbers. Kenya has the highest number of police involved killings in Sub-Saharan Africa right now. Um, and people are presenting all of this data and they're saying the narrative that we're being presented on by, or the narrative we're being presented with on uh, traditional media is not true. It is a skewed narrative that is suited to the demands uh, of power. Social networking has allowed us to shift those narratives. The same can be said of Black Lives Matter, the same can be said of Roads Must Fall, the same can be said of We Are 52%. The same, there's so many examples of if the goal of the advocacy is to shift the narrative, then the digital is a fantastic platform to do that. If the goal of the narrative is to bring down a regime, then it cannot start and end on social networking. It has to be bigger than that. It has to involve the things that Stella's talking about, walking with the people, going into people's homes, the rallies, the movements and all of that. And that's what happened in the Arab, Arab, Arab Spring. The Arab Spring wasn't just about tweets and, and Facebook. It was about people showing up to Tahrir Square every day. Um, and you know, a great example of this is what happened in Sudan um, because in Sudan, people showed up to protest every day for almost eight months in cities all across the country. And there was a, a massive online mobilization to amplify what was happening within the country, to make sure the diaspora was involved, but also to make sure that people in other African countries and other parts of the world were, uh, were aware of what was happening in Sudan, which isn't a very, because of the sanctions, isn't very well connected to the outside world. Um, because of the, this government believing this idea that it was just a social media protest, they switched off the internet and they thought if the internet shut down, there would be no protest. So how did Sudan manage to gather 1.5 million people in Khartoum to protest the regime during an internet shutdown? It's because they also had all of these analog strategies, the civil, um, what are they called? The, 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 the neighborhood committees where people were organized in neighborhood cells. They had people who would get on a bus and who would you know, give, deliver um, a message of, of protest and revolution, get to the end of the bus line, get off the bus, get on another bus, go back in the other direction. And they had this massive mobilization in June 4th to protest the regime that didn't have internet. You know? So to me, I always use that as an example of if the goal is much deeper than, is bigger than shifting a narrative and influencing the conversation, the digital can only be one of many tools that the activist uses. Um, and and it, it, it will deepen the impact of those other tools if it's used in complement, complement to those other tools. And we must always remember that we are in an era of internet shutdowns. 
we are an era of social networking shutdowns. We are an era in an era where the mobile phone companies are in bed with the governments. And if you know the UCC tells MTN switch off the internet, they will switch off the internet, um, even though the, the, they were taken to court. Um, Access now, I think, won um, that case. Um, so we 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 have to keep things in perspective. Overall, I'd, that's what I would say is it has to be one of. It cannot be the only tool. It has to be one of the many tools that the activist, the advocate, is using and complement. Uh, to each other in order to advance the social change. Thank you for that, Nanjana. Sana, do we? Sure. So your question was about possible positive changes arising out of the internet. And um, I, want, I want to give two quick examples that, um, and I think I agree with Nanjana that when we, I use the internet when I want to speak to privileged people, be it class or able-bodied young men or whatever, that I think that the internet speaks particularly to our specific privileged class of people, right? So that also addresses who is excluded. I think you, you, you asked about exclusion in part B of your question, but I want to give two quick examples. One is the Pads for Girls campaign that I mobilized in 2010. 17 in response to a failed promise of sanitary pads by Yoweri Museveni. It was impossible for me to mobilize this if it was not for the internet. The only way that I put my call out, no radio was going to um, give me airtime or TV. What I did was to make a call on Facebook, which was replicated by others on Twitter. Um, and we collected a lot of money, a lot of sanitary pads, and we went to very many schools. As a very simple example of a woman crazy enough to say, how can the government use menstrual blood of girls who can't afford sanitary pads to get votes? And then we do nothing when he says, actually he sent his wife to parliament to say there's no money for sanitary pads. And so in that moment, it was just one crazy woman saying, and they are arresting me because I've written about this outrageous bad performance of Yori Museveni, and I mobilized Ugandans and others in diaspora and all world citizens who are interested in challenging Yori Museveni to send us money for pads. And we took them to schools and we have the statistics and the figures and I was arrested and the money kept to my, to my mobile money um, account. Did that change anything? I have been told, so you gave a few sanitary pads to a few girls who are poor. What about all the others you didn't? And I was like, that was not the point of what I did. The point of what I did was to show that we can challenge a dictator in his own territory using these tools, okay? And I think it has empowered a whole uh, sanitary, menstrual sanitary movement in Uganda. I know there are people who are producing reusable pads and distributing them and doing everything else that they said I failed to do. But the moment was captured and we did stuff. We did stuff against the government and we visibilized the issue, right? And I think many women celebrate that. They may say Stella Nyazi is vulgar and nude and whatever else they say in Sen as well, but she did something with menstruation, speaking power to a patriarch who has guns. The second quick example I want to give, I mean, I want to thank, I want to thank Nanjala and the lady from Zimbabwe for talking about my book. The only way I could take my poems out of prison because all those 160 poems are the remnants of about 600 poems written in prison. Two thirds were confiscated and burnt. The only way we could tell the prison authority, I am writing, I was arrested because of one poem and I'm writing many more, come and arrest me again and again when I'm already in your prison cells, was when my 45th birthday arrived and a group of friends, I don't even know the majority, took to the internet and says, Stella is 45 years old, she's in prison. Let us share her 45 poems. And they went viral. And the world was looking for me about my poems. And the people in prison were like, how is she betting the system? Using the internet, really. Because I'm a prisoner. How are these poems getting out of prison? How are they? And, and so very positive, but simple ways, simple changes. The last example, perhaps, I will give is um, about George Floyd. We know about the anti-police brutality, Black Lives Matter movement, right? I have friends in my village in Kaliga, in Masaka, who understand what police brutality is, but don't understand the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And so I go to the village and we're talking Black Lives Matter. And my boys are saying Wakanda forever. And they're doing all these things. 
and 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 the village comrades are like huh george floyd huh and so i want to talk about exclusion and then i say to them police brutality is real you know my friend nalongo nena she's seated right there she was beaten up by the police when she was pregnant and she almost lost her baby she was beaten up by police who took her from naguru headquarters and she was protesting against the arrest of bobby wine do we understand nalongo nena and they said hey Hey, do we understand police brutality? Hey, is it necessary? Yes, Teta Gisa, it is necessary to take action. And so the vast majority of villagers, similar to my comrades in my village, Kalinga, are excluded from the entire Black Lives Matter movement. And yet they are our comrades and compatriots. And so in terms of answering the second question about exclusion, Black Lives Matter did a lot of things in terms of First of all, it's a wave, this wave against police brutality. It, it's not a one-time thing. George Floyd kind of highlighted a new wave, right? And it went down and there were waves and they're going to go down. But what it did was to unite Africa with America and Europe and China and wherever else. And we saw those protests happening. Even in our backyard in Uganda, people were arrested, right? Um, what it did not do was to include again the rural, the poor, the uneducated, who need a Nalongo Nana to be able to tap into this narrative and, 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 and share the sentiment and perhaps take action. So in terms of exclusion, I want to say that the social media, um, I think Nanjala said, if it's about changing a narrative, that's an important point. But I think the other point is who cannot afford to be invited to that table, right? Who cannot afford? Those of us who speak English sit around thinking, our English speaking arses represent the entirety of Uganda or East Africa. Oh, hey, we don't. <laughs> okay. And so people who understand Nana don't understand George Floyd and are excluded. The rural, and many times women, it's women and girls, not so much boys and men, right? And so there's a gender element, there's a patriarchal element to the exclusion as well as class. The other people I want to talk about are those of us who refuse to praise dictators. We are excluded from the narrative and we have to create safe spaces where we can speak. Otherwise it's dangerous even to invite us into your so-called safe spaces. We make them unsafe. I have had people say, Stella Nez is going, ah, are you sure you're safe? When I'm invited to your TV stations, ah, Stella is coming, won't the police come? Like, like, fuck you guys, like respectfully. No, 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 not funny, not funny, not funny. Like very painful. The idea that we've created spaces that are democratic and yet we are excluding our own soldiers must be um, put out there and combated. And so in terms of exclusion, again, I think that those of us who want to operate away from repressive state machinery, the, I, I want to thank Nanjala for highlighting the Africa-based um, website. I hope it is not controlled by our governments, right? I hope it's not like VPN, because VPN, I don't get VPN quite well. I was shut out of my Facebook timeline during the 2011 elections, and I couldn't report the, 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 the violations that were happening at my polling station. So I hope that this thing that we are creating as Africans cannot be touched by Yori Museveni or Uhuru Kenyatta or Magufuli Magufuli, but that it's an independent space that allows us to network and yet remain autonomous from the restrictions of our governments. Thank you, Sarah. I want to open up to anyone that has a question inside, but even as you prepare your questions, I uh, I forgot to answer one problem with with getting used to the technology. Um, when we're speaking about exclusion, and I, I want you to touch briefly on this, I know you've, you've hinted at it and, and Nanjela would like you to weigh in. Digital feminist activity can also be exclusionist because dominant cultures and languages have a significant role in selecting those who can be heard, included and seen in the movement. Disparity in internet access within geographical locations and socioeconomic class structure is often a barrier in reaching out to the masses. So how can digitization affect women's movements positively? And, and I've had you both um, start to answer that. We know that activists tend to master new technologies faster and better than the general population. 
Are there alternative perspectives that deserve to be had, but are not as proficient in digital media? Angela? Sure. Um, I'll answer the question in two parts. In the first part, I will say, um, the, the, we have to start understanding how the internet matters differently. So the internet matters. I just don't think it matters in a linear way that we, all, we, we want it to matter that just having a critical mass, just having um, um, X amount of people, the more people we get on the internet, the more we're gonna get the benefits from it. I don't think it's that linear. I think we're gonna have many people, for example, who will not want to be on the internet, who will not want to remain analog and will not see that it's a big loss to not have access to the internet. And so the goal cannot just be connect as many people as possible and get to 100% internet penetration and then, uh, then we're done. I think what you want to think about is the, how the internet matters and what people are using the internet for. And in my research, I talk about two effects. I talk about the networking effect and I talk about the amplification effect. The networking effect is that the internet makes it possible for people who have similar political interests, similar social interests to find each other in a way that they wouldn't have been able to find each other offline. And for the women's rights movement, for example, the ability of radical feminists in Africa to find each other in the context of analog public spheres where radical feminism is shunned, where radical feminism is, is, is demonized, where radical feminism is even criminalized, for radical feminists to be able to find each other and talk to each other directly and build communities of interpretation is a really important and powerful thing because first of all it makes the individual feminists feel like they're part of something that they're not just like a lone voice shouting in the wilderness but is actually part of a global movement a regional movement a transnational movement that is advocating for very specific type of social change and what radical feminists in east africa have been able to do by finding each other is is to is to actually start to push back even in the analog that the, the analog which has now become dependent on the internet for content on the internet for insight, for voices, cannot ignore what radical feminists are saying. And that leads me to the second um, um, problem, which is the amplification effect. The amplification effect means that even if you have 100,000 people on Twitter, for example, those 100,000 people, because the radio station, the TV stations, and the newspapers are dependent on the conversations that are happening on Twitter in order to fill their pages or to fill their airwaves, that conversation then gets picked up and then gets transmitted into all of the households that don't have internet access. And this is exactly what's happening in East Africa. So if you look at Twitter, for example, there are only about a million Twitter accounts in Kenya and Kenya has four to seven million people. So one million out of 47 million, that might not seem like such a big deal, but every Friday, the most popular television networks at prime time, so this is about 9 p.m., will go online for 30 minutes and scour the internet for what it is that those 1 million accounts on Twitter are talking about and put them on television. There are shows called The Trend. They are newspaper uh, segments where you know, they'll just literally feature the most popular tweets in Kenya. We call ourselves KOT um, on, in the paper. That amplification effect also matters because it takes the message beyond just those um, um, numbers and, and turns it into something that can be localized, that can be um, uh, useful to the people who are not necessarily online. So because of those two effects, we start to see that feminism and feminist discourse and radical feminist discourse especially has been able to move beyond the boundaries of the formal women's rights movement, which had been struggling for a very long time because of these class-based issues, because of these um, you know, urban versus rural issues, because of the state capture of the women's rights movement in Kenya. You know, the Mandalay Yawanawake movement in Kenya was captured by the one party state, the Kanan regime. It became the Women's League of the one party state. And so the Mandalay Yawanawake movement has always had a legitimacy crisis, has always had this idea that these are Wanawake wa Moi, these are the Moi's women. They're not necessarily articulating the demands of women in the country. It is radical feminists who are organizing on the hashtag, we are 52%, who have been driving the agenda for uh, gender equality in the National Assembly. And it is really a very organic internet based. There is no, we are 52 symposium. There is no, we are 52% conference. There's no, we are 52%, you know, matching t-shirts. There's no, we are 52%. It is really all based on conversations that are happening online that are then getting amplified, that are then getting um, uh, built into these networks where women are being able to have a much more open radical um, um, conversation. So I would say that, um, and this is the second part of, of, of my answer. I would say that 
Um, what feminists have been able to do with the internet is to speak not just for themselves, but to also become vessels um, for amplifying conversations that are happening away from power and to speak the truth to power. And what really needs to keep happening is, um, I, I, I mentioned this in my book, um, there's, Aaron Dachiroy says, there's no such thing as the um, voiceless, only the preferably unheard. And so what we really need is to advance this uh, idea that we're not speaking for poor women, we are not speaking for rural women, we are making it easier for them to be heard. And that begins for the privileged feminist, for the one who finds herself middle class, upper class, that begins with getting better at listening to people who don't have power, to people who don't have privilege and, and giving up the platform and giving the space to those discourses to be articulated in their own terms. Um, as an activist, one of my favorite quotes has always been, if you have come to save me, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because you realize that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I think that spirit of solidarity and that spirit of working across difference and listening across difference is really what will take what's already happening on the internet, what's the mobilization organization that's already happening on the internet and will take it to the next level so that it is more representative of the diversity of, of in class, in wealth, in ethnic background, in whatever that exists within um, uh, women um, all across the world. All right, thank you, Nanjela. And when Nanjela speaks and refers to her book, uh, she's speaking of the book, Digital Democracy, Analog Politics. So do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, please, yes, please. Um, I should have gotten your book, Nanjela. Is it on the markets in Uganda? But we, we, can, we can look. Um, do you know if it's on the market? Uh, yes, I think it's at um, our stock and it's also at... Sorry, somebody Sorry. muted you, but okay, we shall be looking for the book because I think it's important. It speaks a lot to our current... Okay, don't mute me. Don't mute me. Unmute me. Unmute me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted now. I think I muted myself. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so I, want I want to weigh in and just, just add, add two small points. I think for me that um, I've come to a realization that the internet technology enables those of us who are healthy, able bodied. And many times when I'm thinking about exclusion, I want to know who's defining the exclusion. If we are, if we ourselves are defining who's excluded, many times we are not even aware of who's excluded. And so I have a friend called Abdul who is blind and needs braille. He's a man, he's not a woman this time, radical feminism. Abdul's story of a brilliant young man with a PhD and everything has been excluded from participating online up to today, because although he has a braille typewriter, he doesn't have a braille phone. He doesn't have a braille Facebook account, etc., etc. And so when I think about exclusion, specifically when we're operating on digital terms, I think about the girl whose fingers were chopped off and she can't type. And this is not about language or being educated because that's one tier about class and privilege. But the boy who can't see or the woman who does amazing work, but she cannot hear. An empowered feminist who is not able-bodied and has disability or physical challenges of all sorts is excluded from that conversation. The idea about voicing for the other or nobody is voiceless is a, is, is, is a debate and an ongoing debate because I have been in places where people with voice boxes actually have no voice. It's impossible, right? In prison, because of authority and the way that regimes work, journalists and cameras and prison speakers can speak for us and about us, and, but they never allow us to speak for ourselves. So the criminalized feminist woman, the woman doing work in prison, the woman whose story is shared in the media often as 
she's projected out there. We talk about her, we chat about her. She's excluded. <laughs> As a part of what I was doing in prison, I was saying, guys, I have a voice. I will speak for myself. And then many times I was voicing for others. And so I come to the place of the concept of, there, there are many people, many women don't have Adam's apples. And so men don't think we should even speak because they think it's only those with bobbing Adam apples that have a right to voice. And although I may be speaking a lot, many times, especially in Buganda, with all my power and privilege and noise and no longer privileges, which I take advantage of, you know, and I'm a poetess, I talk about poetic justice and all that, many times in my clan, in my culture, I have to shut up, right? And so there are moments when even those of us who have voice and are facilitated as feminists to come to the fore, to come and speak, there are those moments when we are told shut up and because of how we are socialized and how we have normalized silence and absence, you, you, women are supposed to be seen, not heard. We dumb ourselves down and we do nothing. I wanted to talk about um, brilliant feminists, women selling in the markets, women uh, getting small credit schemes and uh, roasting plantain gonja or cassava or maize or whatever. Those women were excluded during COVID-19 times when technological advances were made and UN women, for example, gave a lot of funds to eat red, Uber, you know, Uber and Safe Border and all those gadgets. There are very many feminists who can offer transport, but because they, they she, she has a driving permit, but she really can't type and have, do all those things we do online, she's excluded. And so I'm saying eat red, mm -hmm. E voice, e tax, mobile money, even, right? Well, mobile money, not so much, tend to exclude a number of feminists who are doing brilliant feminist work, market traders. I've been in the markets looking for votes. The most amazing uh, feminist people I've seen doing a different sort of feminism. And I think they have been left out. The other type of people I want to see. Uh, included much more and non breakers. I'm a non breaker. I've been called promiscuous. I've been called profane. I've been called obscene. I've been called insane. I've been called mentally ill. People need to come to the conversation, whether they are perceived as mentally ill or whether they're really mentally ill, right? I think we have to be, bring them in uh, because often those of us who are called insane, mad, lunatic are people who are non breakers. And because we are even breaking the norms of how we organize, many feminists can't do Stella Nyanzi. They, they don't know how to deal with me. They can't deal with my nipples or my buttocks because I'll put them on the front line. And then the feminists who are Christian are like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so, so when does inclusion become inclusion and when are the boundaries of exclusion uh, met? And so all I'm saying is often those of us who are included are very normative, we play along with the rules, okay? And those who are excluded are at the apex, excellent, brilliant minds like myself, or those at the bottom of the rung, sometimes because of physical disability or challenge, sometimes because of capital, sometimes because of social capital, sometimes because of crime. But all these are feminists who must come to the table. I will shut up for now. Uh, thank you, Stella. Yeah. I keep forgetting to unmute. Yes, Maureen, you have a question. Uh, if somebody can move the microphone to Maureen. And as Maureen uh, gets the microphone, uh, Beryl A says, great point, Nanjala, on technology and adaptivity and messaging that outlives technology. Um, there's another comment here from Nozifa who says, well articulated, Nanjala, when we analyze state of the internet in Africa, digital channels are there to amplify the voices, but we need more tools in activism. And another question, a question for you, Nanjala, actually, from Chennai Chair says, um, Nanjala raises localization as a key point. Are there any examples she can share on localization of digital rights issues, specifically the right to privacy? Uh, Nanjala, if you could take that question and then we'll have the question from the room. Sure, um, that's a fantastic uh, question. question. Um, that's a really fantastic question. And I think it's more that some people, people have just started thinking about these things. 
Um, and and so I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a of a really standout example um, of how localization has happened. Um, I will say that one of the things that I has been really tremendous to watch um, in Kenya, for example, is that the digital rights conversation in Kenya is not being led by foreign um, nonprofits. It's not being led by big multilateral NGOs. It's being led by local organizations. And I think it's the same in Uganda. It's it's really people and, and, and particularly young people who have noticed that their digital lives were not being comprehended in the traditional rights conversation. And so it's not the big amnesties and it's not the big human rights watches and all of those organizations that are, are leading this conversation. But in Kenya, for example, the, the, it's uh, the Bloggers Association of Kenya that has uh, been at the forefront of all of these litigations and trying to have a conversation around digital rights that begins with what are your rights vis-a-vis -vis the Kenyan government, not necessarily what is coming from the states or what is coming from uh, and, and uh, other parts of the world. And so I think we're going to see a lot more um, um, conversations around this. I think we're going to see a, a lot more drive in the next couple of years. Um, as Western and Eastern um, companies start to more and more face Africa as a growth um, you know, business opportunity, I think that they're going to come and they're going to find that people had already been organized for a number of years. And I think what's already happening is they're being forced to meet people where they are and they're being forced to respond to the structures that are already in place. So, you know, Mark Zuckerberg can't just fly into Kenya and meet with the cabinet secretary and, and, and leave. He has to also make time to come and meet with Kenyan developers and make time to come and meet with Kenyan um, um, activists. Um, but yeah, I, I think off the top of my head, I can't think of a standout example, but I'm, I'm, I'm inspired to think that we're gonna see more and more in the next couple of years. All right, uh, Warren, let's take your question. Thank you so much for your question. My question goes to what you were saying. You talked about exclusion. And I'm worried at my profession, I'm a Senegal digital director. And we work with very dedicated people. And sometimes, some of the questions they ask, because some of them read about you. and. I'm happy that today I, I'm in the same room with you. So, as you are giving out your information, have you ever thought about those other people, like the deaf, the blind? Are they not part of your target group as you are giving out your information? Then, too, it's about the, the vocabularies that you use as you are giving out, out your information. Because it is about giving, and then the people who are receiving. Like most of the most of the people with disabilities, some of them have never gone to school. Some can't read, and those who can read, the the wordings are really very hard. The vocabulary, so <laughs> they end up not understanding you. This also goes back to all of us, like. As we are having this conversation today, is it inclusive? For the deaf people who can access, who can be online, what have they have they benefited from this discussion? Those of the others who are streaming online, for example, do we have the how do they call them? Those words. Captions. Do we have the captions? So inclusion begins with us. As we are doing something, as we are giving up information, please first think about the other people who cannot hear, who cannot see. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Uh, Stella, as you respond to this, you can also make your closing remarks. And then, Angela, I'll allow you to also make your closing remarks. Right. So. Right, so I'm delighted to be in the presence of a person who understands what physical disability is and what physical challenges are. And I want to thank you for your contribution because many times I think even those of you who enable the disabled to participate in these spaces, you are also excluded. So sign language interpreters, the, what are they called? The guides of blind people and very many other enablers of the disabled. Often you're dis you're, you're, you're excluded. 
I think that sometimes uh, when I've been in uh, or organizing, the reason why I'm very critical of civil society these days is because everything has been monetized. I have had sometimes to say there's a lady who needs her guide to come with her. And they say, those are two people. Yeah, we are going to be giving for DM. She's got, now in social distancing times, I think they'll even say, they're going to take a whole table on their own, right? So how we even begin to make it possible. Sometimes you just like wasteful, that disabled person, even though they are capable, are a waste and a drain on our resources because you're not just inviting one Stella, you're inviting Stella and her enabler. I want to say very quickly that we are learning. It's a journey. It's a journey. I didn't know that I was not communicating until I met Abdul. I told you about Abdul. I went to Macquarie University for my first degree, up to my third degree in mass communication and literature with Abdul. He beat us in class every year, every term. We're doing three terms, not semesters, which are two. Every term, every year, Abdul beat us with his blindness and his loud typewriter. You know how those typewriters were, the braille ones, okay? And it was only recently when I was beginning to develop my campaign material, a very beautiful poster that Abdul communicated with me and said, but Stella, <laughs> like on the say, like, like, you know, you have left me out. I'm not included in your campaign at all. Apart from hearing your words, I'm not part of this. And then my, I've, I've been advocating for democratic rights and democratizing spaces, but I'd never really begun to understand what it means to exclude brilliant minds such as these people. And so I want to say to you, thank you very much, Maureen. Come to these spaces, bring your communities to these spaces. Keep doing the work you do on TV. I think it's important. Make us aware, make us uncomfortable to the point that we shall say we have to budget and include you in our budgets and to open up spaces, right? Because many of us are not even aware. I want in the same breath to say, you know, because of Abdul, I know that physical disability does not speak to the mind. Some of the most brilliant geniuses in Uganda have physical challenges. And so the idea that a literature scholar, a poetess who has uh, who is blind, does not understand when Stella Nyanzi says matako uh, matako, and that it can't be interpreted, for example, is, 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 is a lie. It's a blatant lie. There are ways to interpret these things. Like, you know, like Stella Nyanzi said ka, 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 ka. Okay, who doesn't understand ka, 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 for example? And I'm not being obscene. But I'm inviting you to make the journey with those of us who break norms. And are like diplomatic language has been domesticated by dictatorships. And sometimes you need to do the ka, 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 ka. Museveni ka, ka, ka constitution. How do you interpret that? And then begin a conversation that is very, very uncomfortable because the, 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 the deaf person will say, how does Museveni ka, ka, ka constitution? And the conversation begins. It doesn't mean they don't understand because they know what ka, ka, ka means. It's a metaphor. And I think able-bodied persons are also invited to interpret what I'm writing and saying. It's not easy for anybody. It's uncomfortable for a purpose. And so vulgarity and the language that I use, I hear your, I hear your comment and I appreciate it. However, I'm sorry, I will not turn down for anyone. Come with me on my journey. What I do is not for everybody, but your Museveni gets offended by it. And because sometimes it's my only target audience, I will do it. As I conclude, I want to thank very much the people. <laughs> no, it's not funny, it's serious. As I conclude, I want to thank very much Sipesa. Uh, I want to thank very much the organizers of Forum on Internet Freedom. In Africa 2020, we have made this possible. We didn't think it was possible. It's the first time I am experimenting with physical presence and this. I want to celebrate Nanjala because you were there. Finally, when I saw you and heard you, I raised my fists like that in victory because we have said it's possible for us to organize across borders in COVID-19 times using the internet. It's not always easy, but then it has been made possible. And I want to thank our moderator because your questions were difficult as hell, but they made us think in innovative ways. Thank you very much. And to the audience, you've been wonderful. Let's keep doing what we do. Yes, there's a, a hand waving. Uh, yeah.
Yeah. Oops, I'm not from Puerto So I, I know she's, she will find you during the break. But just to say, I, I see you. I see you. You're going to have to find your sister during the break. Um, just to make it clear, the doctor who Abdul that you were referring to was in the session yesterday. Oh, he was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we are opening up the space. We are opening up the space. So Maybe I haven't yet, but. The session where he was yesterday was uh, promoting access to information for persons with disability. Um, okay. There was a sign language interpreter, interpreter and a featured report launch on accessibility of telecommunication services for persons with disability. Okay, so I'm, 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 our hearts are beating the same, but I think he, Abdul is one, there are many millions, millions, brilliant, although physically challenged, but even mentally ill people, some of my best strategists have bipolar. I have been called mentally ill and that threw me with mentally, like mentally ill fraternity in Uganda and they have amazing ideas. They just sit there and when the drugs are not doing things to them, amazing ideas as well as the absurd come along, but amazing ideas. So we should not even leave out those who we think don't have anything to contribute. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Dr. Thank, thank you very much. For all this info is for, I mean, your brain is simply amazing. You cannot uh, say thank you now. Um, Angela, do you want to make your closing remarks? Sure. Um, again, just to echo um, um, some of secret. It's a great uh, feeling to be here. I'm a, I've always I've been a huge fan of Stella's work for a long time, so it's it's a great honor to be on the panel with her. And FIFA, you know, we've, we have a long history together, so it's, it's always good to be back in this room. And in, in terms of actual um, substantive closing remarks, I will say um, that people don't, uh, we must not forfeit our agency, and we must not forfeit our ability to shape the internet to shape our social lives, to shape our political lives. Um, we have been, I love what Stella says because I think it also echoes what uh, Wangari Mathai said and what a number of uh, amazing women have said throughout history. Um, Well-behaved women never seldom make history. Um, if you want to make history, you have to break norms, you have to break convention. And I think the same applies to this uh, way in which African societies are starting to define digital rights norms. If we want our digital futures to represent more than what our analog um, lives have been able to accomplish, then we have to dare to push beyond the norms and we have to dare to push beyond what we have been told is possible, feasible, um, uh, desirable even for Africa and start to reimagine positive, inclusive, um, um, powerful digital futures and start to work towards that because ultimately we just, we have the power to decide, we choose, we decide, we are the people who will shape our digital futures. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nanjela, and thank you to uh, the people that have been participating in this conversation online and to all of you that are in the room here with us uh, and participating in this conversation. Once again, thank you, Dr. Stella, and a big thank you to Sipesa for putting this together. Well, that brings us to the end of our session, and thank you for participating. Um, um.